Hello, my name is Zach Gibbs and I'm a content developer within Education Services inside Juniper Networks. And today we will be discussing the configuring static NAT with JWeb Learning Byte. All right, so you might ask yourself at this point, what is static NAT? And it's basically a type of NAT, which is network address translation that allows bi-directional initiation of translation. So that means that you're going to configure a static NAT rule that will translate a packet in one direction, and then it will also translate the packet in another direction. So it allows you to configure one NAT rule and translation happens both ways. So for example, if you configure source NAT, you're only going to translate in one direction. And same thing with destination NAT. There's basically one type of static NAT, and that's a prefix-based NAT configuration that creates a one-to-one -one mapping. And PAT is also available, so that's port address translation. And the last bullet here, keep in mind that static NAT rules take precedence over other NAT rules, such as source or destination NAT rules. Okay, so let's get to the example. Here on the slide, we have a couple different things I want to point out. First, we have the user that is on the internet, and then we have an internal server that need to communicate with each other. Now, this is a little different. Uh, it's not just the server needing to communicate with the internet or hosts on the internet, and it's not just hosts on the internet that need to communicate with the internal server. We need bi-directional communication here. Now, keep in mind, you could configure a source NAT rule and a destination NAT rule, and it would accomplish a similar result. However, we can configure a static NAT rule, just one, to meet the criteria of the example. So we're gonna configure that bi-directional communication using static NAT with JWeb. So let's go ahead and first jump to the user and show that we don't have access, or rather the user doesn't have access to the internal server. Okay, here is the user, and the address 10.11.11.1 .11 is the address that the user is going to use to attempt to communicate with that internal server. And as you can see, it's not working. The request is going to time out. There's the first ping packet that timed out. And so let's go ahead and jump to the server, see if the server can communicate with the user. All right, here is the server. That's the address of the user. And of course, the server can't reach the user either. That makes sense. We're going to need to configure some static net to get this to work. So let's go ahead and jump to the JWeb interface for VSRX1. All right, so here is the JWeb user interface, the GUI. And uh, first thing I want to point out is on the left, we do have the, uh, the ribbon that shows the different workspaces. We have the dashboard, monitor, configure, reports, administration, things like that. And we are going to be spending the bulk of our time in the configure workspace. And then we'll also jump into the monitor workspace to look at a few things after we have static NAT working. So we're already in the configure workspace. Let's go ahead and jump to security and then to NAT and then to static NAT. Okay, so here is static NAT, and we do need to configure a new static NAT rule set before we can do anything else. So we can select the create button or new create new static NAT rule button, and we're going to call this static NAT-LB for learning byte. And in the from criteria, we can select routing instance zone interface. In this scenario, we're going to select zone, and then we're going to select from the DMZ zone. That is the zone that the server is in. So we're going to move that over, and then we can click the new button or create button to create a new rule. And we can name this rule. We'll call this static NAT rule LB. And we need to add in some criteria. And the match criteria for source and destination, or excuse me, for source and source ports isn't required. You can add that if you want to get granular with this, but it's not necessary. We do, however, have to add in a destination address. And with that, we want to use the address that the user was using to access or attempt to communicate with the server. So we can scroll down to here, type in the address. Then we need to configure the then parameters. How are we going to translate this information? And we'll want to translate it to the internal IP address of the server. And then we can we can do other things like we can change the port, we can map. Currently it's set to map 
any port. We can do that in the match criteria as well. I forgot to talk about that. We can also do that in, or excuse me, the destination ports. We're going to match on a destination port, and then we can map it to another port. For example, I can select port, and then we'd enter a port. We could do a range as well. I'm not going to do that. We're just going to say any port, basically. So whatever port this comes in on, this traffic comes in on, we're going to translate it to that new port. And then we can also configure a routing instance. Now this would be useful if there is a routing instance on the VSRX device that we need to send this traffic to. That's not the scenario here. So let's select OK. And we've created the rule within the rule set. We need to click OK again. That validates the configuration and we do get information that we need to commit or a pop-up rather. So let's go up and commit the configuration. Okay, that configuration has committed successfully. So let's go ahead and jump to the user, see if we can uh, communicate with the server. However, I do wanna show you that. Notice how we don't see a rule yet. We need to select the actual rule set to get the rule to appear in the rules in selected rule set option or section. So let's go ahead and jump to the user. All right, so actually I just realized before we jump to the user, let's actually, I, I made a mistake. I was looking at the rule just real quickly or think about the rule. We need to edit, or excuse me, not the rule, but the rule set. And I need to edit that. That actually needs to not be DMZ. We need to have it be the untrust zone. So that's the zone that the user is coming in on. So we'll click OK and then we'll go ahead and commit again. OK, that committed successfully. Let's jump to the user. All right, here's the user and we are pinging our, or the ping test is now working. That's great, that's what we want to see. Let's go ahead and jump to the server. All right, this is good news too. The server can ping the user as well. So that's perfect. So let's go ahead and jump back to the JWeb GUI and go to the monitoring workspace to look at a few static NAT things. All right, here is the JWeb GUI. So let's go to the monitor section and let's go to NAT static NAT, and we can see a few things in here. We can see our static NAT rule. You can actually change this to a specific static NAT rule, or you can just change it to all. In our case, we only have one static NAT rule, so, or rule set that is. And so we only need to show the one, or we can use all, it doesn't matter. Okay, so we have a few different things. We can see the from zone that we're using. We can see the name, the destination address, the host address, the net mask, a routing instance if we're using it, how many sessions that we uh, you know, successful, failed, current, things like that. And then at the bottom we have the bar graph that shows the translation hits. And we can hover over the bar on the bar graph to get the actual, to get the static net rule name. And here we can see static net rule dash LB. Now I do want to go to the security flow session workspace so we can actually look at the flow in JWeb. And in the flow session workspace, we can type in some criteria. We'll just type in ICMP, click search, and here we can see the different sessions happening. Now look at this. You can see there's a session for the user that is using the 172.25.11.100 IP address and a session for the server that is using the source IP address of 10.5.5.100. And so that's perfect. That's what we want to see. However, keep in mind with this that we're only seeing the initiating flow of the session. So we need to jump to the CLI to see the return flow as well for these sessions. So let's go ahead and jump to the CLI of VSRX1 and check that out. Okay, so here is the CLI for VSRX1. And let's go ahead and look at the actual flow sessions that we have going through for ICMP. And we can see a few different things here. We can see that, for example, we'll pick the, uh, the bottom session here. We can see that 10.5.5.100 is communicating with 172.25.11.100. Now that's something we already have in the JWeb GUI. That's great, that's the initiating flow, but the return flow is what we don't have. The return flow shows 172.25.11.100 is going to 10.11.11.1. Now we can extrapolate the NAT that is occurring here. We can see that 10.5.5.100 is being translated to 10.11.11.1 because that's who, or rather, that is the IP address, that 10.11.11.1 is the IP address that the user at 172.25.11.100 is communicating with. And if we look at that second to last session in this output, we can see it's the user initiating the 172.25.11.100 to the 10.11.11.1 address. Now that part was in the JWeb interface, 
but we also have the return flow of 10.5.5.100 is sending traffic to 172.25.11.100. So we can see the net here, we can extrapolate that 10.11.11.1 is being translated to 10.5.5.100. And we did that by creating a static net rule to allow that bi-directional communication. So that brings us to the end of this learning bite. We discussed static NAT and we demonstrated how to configure static NAT using JWeb. So as always, thanks for watching. Visit the Juniper Education Services website to learn more about courses. View our full range of classroom, online, and e-learning courses. Learning paths, industry segment and technology specific training paths. Juniper Networks Certification Program, the ultimate demonstration of your competence. And the training community, from forums to social media, join the discussion.